like to introduce Sister Amanda Stewart to preach to us today. favorite hymns, sing that every day. If, um, I mean, I can, but I can sing it every day. How I proved him more and more. That one phrase, how I proved him more and more. I've pondered on that many times. How I proved him more and more without faith, without allowing God to do what he does, without putting my hand in it. Have I really, really been proving him? And have I allowed him to prove himself to me in turn leading others to Christ? In January, I went on a 21 day fast. Um, and during the fast, I realized that my faith was not where it should have been or where it could be. Um, I was lacking, lacking in many regards, many different aspects of my life. Like I said, I don't know how many of you were here from not when I said I lost my voice in November. When I tell you I had zero faith that my voice would come back, zero faith. Even now, I stand up here clutching my pearls that are non-existent, praying to God that my voice does not give out on me. Have my good days when I'm singing, have my bad days when I'm singing. But through that fast, I learned that I needed to depend on God. He's my only hope. I realized also that instead of preparing for good things, I always prepared for the worst. Um, that's not faith. So in that aspect of my life, I realized I was lacking. Like I need to, I need to expect better, bigger things, and not always prepare for you know the bad stuff in life. Took my LSAT during that period, and I I went in faith filled. I was excited about it. I was like, God got me. I'll do great. And when I got to the testing site, it seemed like everything was going up against me. Nothing was going right. Um, even during the test, I was, I was struggling. And there was a point when I started to doubt myself. I doubted God. I'm like, come on. Like, I've been fasting for this. I've been praying about this. Why is it that nothing is going right? And after the test, after I really was able to ponder what had happened, I was like, all right, well, this must be the faith that gets tested, that Job experienced, right? That Abraham experienced. My faith was tested. Um, 
the definition of faith is complete trust or confidence in something. And according to Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse one also tells us that faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I implore each and every one of you today to try faith, it works. Try faith, it works. That's what I'm gonna be talking to you guys about. Well, I can spend hours and days talking about the who, what, where, when, why, and how of faith. I've condensed a week-long conversation about faith into seven points that I found are important for everyone to know and understand about faith. Point one, faithfulness and faith go hand in hand. Faithfulness is the act of remaining loyal and steadfast. Being faithful to God requires our willingness to follow him and build our relationship with him. One of the fruits of the spirit are faith. Galatians chapter five, verse 22 says this, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and against such there is no law. Just having love doesn't make us faithful. Just having joy does not make us faithful. It goes on. We can't have one fruit of the spirit without the other. So even if you have it all together in every other aspect but faith, understand that you don't have it all right and that there is work to be done. You cannot consider yourself to be faithful, a faithful follower of Christ if you're not acting in all of the fruits. If you don't have faith, you cannot be faithful. After all, loyalty is built and based on the concepts of trust. Without faith, we know this, it is impossible to keep God. A good relationship requires faith and faithfulness. A model relationship exhibits trust between the parties involved, and it's expected that there is a foundation of trust to help the relationship grow. In order for the relationship to be maintained and thrive, you have to remain loyal to that person or persons involved in the relationship. Whatever that means for who's involved in the relationship, there's a mutual understanding that essentially trust, which would be faith, and loyalty, which is faithfulness, are key components in the success of the relationship. And if we have these expectations amongst ourselves, it would be very unwise to believe that God does not hold us to this same standard of trust or faith and loyalty, faithfulness. If we can trust those around us who don't necessarily deserve it, Surely we should not struggle to put all of our faith in the one who is not only the perfect example of it, but created the concepts of faith, trust, right? After making the conscious decision to put your trust in God, the next step is holding on to that, remaining loyal. You cannot be faithful without faith. Our faithfulness to God requires complete surrender of ourselves. Point two, faith requires work. In Mark chapter 5, verse 24 to 34, Matthew chapter 9, verse 20 to 26, and Luke chapter 8, verse 42 to 48, um, those three chapters, we see the story outlined of the woman with the issue of blood. And we know our faith doesn't need to be big. And that's told to us in chapter, Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. Faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. We talk about this woman through the lens of her faith healing her. And I'm going to approach the story in the scope of work, so follow me. Um, when babies or toddlers are crawling or walking and they realize they need or want something, they will do whatever they can to get our attention, whether that be scream, tug, pull, kick, whatever it is, they'll do what they need to do to get our attention. Of course, they're doing things non-verbally because they can't communicate with us properly. Um, but regardless of what it is, if they pull on our clothes, depending on how hard they do it, will determine if we recognize them or not. Now, this woman with the issue of blood, she had an issue. She had an issue. And she needed and wanted something from God. And she said, I just need to touch the hem of his garment and will be healed. Not touch his hand, his feet, his head. But she had faith that all she needed to do was touch. Touch is a verb, right? It is a word that describes an action. She put her faith into action. She decided that her struggle can't be bigger than her God. She took her faith, the faith that had been abused, experimented with, banned, disqualified, embarrassed, 
that she believed that she just needed to touch something that was connected or associated to God. And she worked her way through the crowd with strong belief and faith because she was determined that she was going to get what she had gone there for. This could have been her last chance to act on faith, and she did act. My flesh would say there's no way that just touching a hem um, would, you know, change my circumstance. What is touching a piece of cloth going to do to something I've been struggling with for years? And just touching proved to do a whole lot for this woman. Now, while this shows that faith heals, this woman is also an example of the importance of actively doing and what faith at work does. A lot of us here have the faith but aren't willing to touch or do what connects us to Jesus, especially when it seems too difficult. We don't make the time or effort to pray fast, read the word of God consistently, but instead we allow fear to get in and diminish our faith. Faith cannot be ignored and it's been proven to work. Faith is not saying you want something from God and then you're not willing to meet him halfway. If only we were more intentional about, intentional about making sure our words of faith and actions align, just like the woman with the issue of blood, we would really see more of God and his capabilities in our lives. In a natural sense, faith at work is asking God to help you do well on an exam and actually studying for it, right? Faith at work is asking God to bless you with a job and actually applying for a job. Faith at work is asking God to keep you in good health and you're actually eating right and exercising and doing the things that your body needs to be done to be kept in good health. Point three, faith requires the spirit of expectancy. When approaching the Lord, we cannot come last. We are to approach him boldly with our needs, expecting to see God work. If you're ever curious about what faith and the spirit of expectancy looks like, pay attention to the beggars you see every day or every other day in the same exact spot. They're there because they expect to receive something. And logically speaking, it just wouldn't make sense, at least to me, to you know, be at the same spot if I'm not expecting to receive anything or if I have not already received something. In Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, we have the story of the lame man, and it reads, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. The layman looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. Your faith may not get you what you want, but it'll certainly get you what you need. He made sure to be carried. He, meaning the lame man, made sure to be carried to the gate every day because he was expecting something. In that moment of faith, he asked for money but because Peter and John did not have what he asked for. They instead decided to give him something greater so that he could go and tell of the goodness of God. Not only did the man receive something, but God got the glory out of that entire situation. He led, this man led people to Christ because they were able to see for themselves the impact this, that this man's faith had on him and his life. This right here shows that what we are expecting from God, he will double because of our faith. Ephesians chapter three, verse 20 to 21 says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, amen. Amen, as it is so, it is finished. Expect great things from God. Expect the unexpected and watch how God will show up and show out for you. Point four, faith requires a positive attitude. Uh, for me, I, again, another realization, self-evaluation. Um, I was left wondering 
why is it that God sees good things for me, but I can't see them for myself? When Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Faith means looking ahead to the reward we have in and with Christ. A positive attitude helps you to see and understand the importance of faith and God deeper. Allow your faith to be so strong that no matter what you're going through, you can go boldly remembering he is our shepherd and that the reward he has waiting for us is far greater than what we can see now. Matthew chapter 21 verse 22 says you can pray for anything and if you have faith, you will receive it. This means that when we pray, we are to go in believing 100%. You get out what you put in. Again, you get out what you put in. You cannot be negative and expect a positive outcome. We can strive for positive attitudes by meditating on the declaration of praise in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 8 through 14, which reads, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Let the people know what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his great works. Have joy in his holy name. Let the heart of those who look to the Lord be glad. Look to the Lord and ask for his strength. Look to him all the time. Remember his great works, which he has done. Remember the special things he has done and how he has judged. O children of Israel, his servants, sons of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. He is judge of all the earth. Because he is our God and judge, we know we have hope in him as long as we do thus, says the Lord. Positivity is great and it's key. However, I found it can be very difficult to keep that positive mindset when you don't fully understand or when you forget the promises of God. Point five, faith requires understanding God's promise. I proclaimed faith with my mouth, but after really searching myself, my heart wasn't aligned with the faith I professed. I thought it was until I realized I was picking and choosing what I wanted to include God in or let God handle. That's not faith, that's fear. And that was me trying to control God. With a declaration of faith, you can't only include God in the small things and leave him out of the bigger things, vice versa. It's a package deal shared equally. This is where the, the understanding of God's promises comes into play. Galatians chapter three, verses 26 and 29 says, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. We are heirs according to the promise that was made and as a result, and that was as a result of Abraham's faith. Because we are called to live or because of Abraham's faith, we are called to live by that same faith in order to see the fruit of Abraham's faith continue for generations to come. With the faith we have today, we may never see it come to pass as promised, but we can continue knowing that even if we don't see his promise fulfilled the way we want to with our eyes and in this lifetime, it'll be, be fulfilled some way, somehow, according to the word of God. And why? Because he is not a man that he should lie. Point six, faith leads to forgiveness. For anyone who thinks that they're so far gone and that God is not interested in you anymore, I implore you to keep your faith. And if you don't have any, ask God to show you who he is so you can trust his being and his nature. If your faith is lacking, ask God to increase your faith. There's always redemption in God. Don't let anyone tell you any different. We go to God because of who he is, not because of what we have done. And how do we know that faith leads to forgiveness? Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemed And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it's easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But, they, but that ye may know 
that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then said he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But the multitude, but when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Jesus healed the man with the palsy, even though the scribes didn't believe he was worthy of forgiveness. The requirements of man differ from those of God. While speaking on forgiveness, um, I encourage each and every one to forgive yourself, forgive those around you. If you're like me, it may be difficult, more difficult to forgive yourself than it is to do others, but it's very important that that's done. Forgiveness is a part of our faith. Our ability to forgive or lack thereof is telling of the condition of our faith. The Bible says that we are to forgive 70 times seven, not for us to keep count or to put stipulations on forgiveness and whether it's convenient for us or not. And let's be honest, um, forgiveness is not always convenient, but it's necessary. Point seven, true faith has to be more than a feeling. Feeling is an emotional state or reaction. And faith is a lifestyle rooted in the assurance that what God speaks is what will come to pass. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 39 is a call to persevere in faith. Specifically, verse 22 says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verses 35 through 39, so do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. That being said, we need to be persistent, consistent in our walk with Christ and quest to have faith become part of our lifestyle. In Hebrews chapter 11, references made to Enoch, Noah, Sarah, Gideon, and Samson, as well as other men and women that didn't move based on feeling. They acted instead in obedience because of their faith in God. Even when what, even when what God wanted them to do or what he told them to do did not make sense. They moved with assurance knowing that all would be well in the end. In the 39th and 40th verse of Hebrews chapter 11, it says, all these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. Sometimes relying on feelings can be the worst thing we could do for ourselves. Our feelings will fail us and have us confused. So rely on God and trust him completely. Faith is personal. You have to trust God for yourself. You cannot rely on another's own belief or even their belief for God to move on your behalf. At the end of the day, no matter how much someone else prays for you, if you do not want it for yourself, God will not give it to you. Sometimes it's not that God doesn't hear our prayers for someone else. He's hearing he just understands and he knows that it isn't going to, he's not going to give it to somebody who's, who's willfully decided that they do not want the good things that can't be made available to them. If only they believe and trust God completely, they'd see the fruit of God in their life. In all things, God will prove himself. So be present and see the goodness of God. Ask him to increase your faith so he has room in your life to prove himself. In Judges chapter 6, verses 36 through 40, you can go home and read it on your own. But God told Gideon he would not be going to fight with thousands of men, but rather 300, and that God would come through for them. Gideon asked for sign after sign and was very specific with what he wanted to see from God. God was merciful, and God provided, he proved himself by doing just as Gideon asked. Our faith will require us to be specific sometimes. Put your faith in God. Being followers of Christ will never negate the fact that we are human. And I'm sure no one here can say that they've never wrestled with their faith. It can be difficult because choosing to trust God completely means you have no control over your situation, over what's going on. But it's probably the best thing we could do for ourselves. 
When our faith wavers, we can always remember his grace and mercy and know that we have an advocate with him. We have history with him that should remind us to continue to have faith in him. He is the author and finisher of our faith and knows what's best for us. His ways will always be past finding out. Our only job is to humbly submit to our God and with confidence say, thy will be done. And then when it's all said and done, your testimony can then be, I'm so glad I've learned to trust him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me.